UBC's chapter of Saikai acknowledges that it operates on UBC's infrastructure, which is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Please appreciate the meaning behind the statement as we move forward with the Labyrinth podcast. Now. Welcome to the Labyrinth podcast. Thousands of students, less than 100 labs. How do you find your way around the maze of research opportunities? We are UBC Saikai, and this podcast serves as a one-way route to everything you need to hear about UBC Psychology Labs. We invite principal investigators and lab members to encourage, educate, and inform students about research opportunities in psychology. My name is Sian Kim, and I am an executive coordinator at Saikai. Today, we're very lucky to have Kyle Gooderman, a PhD student from the Attentional Neuroscience Lab. Thank you for joining us, and how are you doing today? Hey, thanks so much for having me and uh, for the invite. I'm doing well. Um, Yeah, yeah, it's a good day. Yeah, very excited to be hosting you today. And as um, just to start, would you kindly introduce the Attentional Neuroscience Lab to somebody who's maybe hearing about it for the first time? Yeah, certainly. I'd love to. So um, the Attentional Neuroscience Lab is directed by Dr. Todd Handy. A uh, faculty member and professor in the Department of Psychology at UBC. Um, the Attentional Neuroscience Lab has, over its many year history, done uh, many different and wild and wonderful and exciting things, uh, specifically, obviously, attention. So right. there's a real emphasis to study and understand uh, attentional processes and what, that's, what that kind of looks like in terms of human cognition. Um, and recently, uh, that whole world has flourished into understanding, um, I would say, maybe less, less of the nitty gritties of attention and more about the application of that kind of knowledge uh, in, in broader contexts and, and uh, in the world more generally. Right. Um, could you speak to some research that reflects on how um, important it is to apply what we know about attentional neuroscience, um, speaking to a broader context? Of course, yeah. Um, so thinking about attention, um, the, the study that always pops into my mind is not one that comes from our lab, but there's a really famous study that, that looks at the restorative effects of nature uh, on attention. And so in the study, um, and I'm, I'm probably butchering some of the details, so don't quote me directly on this, <laughs> go, go look it up. It's in nature, it's a famous study. Um, but what happened is uh, these researchers, they had uh, individuals walk around in natural environments. So in, in like a forest or a park or something, I don't remember the details. Um, and then they also had individuals walk around in an urban setting. And they look to see, okay, well, what are the differences in terms of um, their ability to maintain, uh, yeah, I guess, maintain attention right. um, after, after having these sort of walkabouts in these neighborhoods. And they found that people who were in nature were a little bit, you know, had, had better attention uh, capacities than those who were in urban environments. So, so things like that. And obviously that's not, the study didn't come from our lab, but, but that kind of idea is, okay, how can we take, um, how can we take what we know about attention and put it into, in, into action for people? And so uh, one of my colleagues, um, just to give you a preview, one of my colleagues does work looking at how, um, looking at how attention is distributed during situations where we notice something uh, sort of in our periphery that is attention grabbing. And so specifically, she's looking at things like uh, fidgeting and, and motion and movement. And so understanding like, okay, what, what about that is attention grabbing? Why is that important? And what does that mean? What does that mean about our understanding of attention globally and more broadly um, and its application in the real world? So that kind of thing is, is, yeah. Right. Would you say that that application aspect of doing research is what motivates you to continue doing the research that you do? Absolutely. Um, I actually think that the application component is probably the most critical for me in terms of what I'm really passionate about. Um, in part because I, you know I think that there's there's obviously a lot of value in understanding how um, how things work at a really sort of 
minute level or very scientific level, I guess is maybe the way I'd put it. But I think that there's a lot of value or even more value sometimes in understanding how these things can be applied to make meaningful change and meaningfully help people in the real world. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the way that I've shifted some of my research focus is about really understanding how, how these things can, can impact people in their everyday lives with the hope that we can make their lives a little bit better. Right. And as a graduate student, could you speak to what your day-to-day, maybe even monthly or yearly responsibilities include? Um, I know that our listeners are, a lot of our listeners are probably interested in pursuing a graduate path. And I think you bring that unique perspective. So would you kindly speak to what that looks like? Of course. Yeah. So um, I, let's start with the day-to-day and then we can sort of broaden it out to look at weeks sure. and months and years, because I think that might help people. Um, so the day-to-day tasks of a graduate student are, are, or at least can be extremely varied. Um, and so as a graduate student, you wear many hats, you've got many different roles, many different responsibilities. Um, at some points you're a researcher at other points, you might be a teaching assistant. Um, at some point you might be teaching something altogether on your own. Um, and so and, and I should mention as well, obviously, you might have multiple different research projects ongoing at any given time, and you might be in different stages within any of those projects. So um, the day-to-day is, it can be incredibly varied um, in terms of what you're expected to do. I've, I've had days where, um, you know, I've sat down and all it's been has been grading, and it's been that way for days. You know, all I'm doing is reading papers and giving grades, um, And then I've had other days where, you know, things are kind of going on and, and I can, you know, I can be a bit more hands-off and I can, I can focus on some other things that haven't been sort of front of mind. Um, In terms of weeks, I think you get a real smattering of different kind of activities throughout the week. So you might spend a few hours on one day doing something like data analysis and then you know, a handful of hours attending class as a TA and then answering emails seems to be <laughs> to be a huge component of what we do. I should have mentioned that in the day to day, you know, hours of hours of our day can be spent sending emails and so just like responding to inquiries, whatever they might be. Um, so that kind of thing is is sort of what a week to week looks like. Again, very, very diverse sort of set of activities. Um, Once we get into months, it kind of stabilizes in a weird way. Uh, There's obviously the academic calendar. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? Like you you kind of think like, oh, if it's so varied day to day, then certainly it must vary, you know, as you scale up. But the reality is is that at least what I found, and and I'm sure others have different opinions on this, um, but I found that when you look at month to month, because there's sort of themes the months come in chunks. So you've got, you know, your academic calendar year. So September to December, and then beginning of January through to April or whatever it turns out to be, you know, you can kind of predict what you're going to be doing. So I know, I know, for example, if I'm TAing that, you know, exams, final exams happen and all the, all the undergraduate students are all happy, rightfully, congratulations, you finished the course, go and celebrate. But that's actually the moment where work starts for, for us, right? Because now it's our turn to go in and, and do the grading and, and hopefully get those back to you as soon as we can. And so when you kind of take that step back and you say, okay, this is, this is kind of what the, the whole month is going to look like or a few months, it's a bit easier to track out kind of um, and anticipate what it is you're going to need to do at any given right. time. Right? Um, you can kind of forecast, okay, this is, this is what's going to happen or, or midterms are going to happen. So I'm going to be doing grading or, or, you know, at August is sort of the ramp up period in some respects. So in August, you know, we're trying to get ethics approved so that when September rolls around, we can start collecting data right away when students come back and they're, they're in session and we can, we can start collecting data through the human subject pool. So, you know, I think when it comes to a month, it's a little bit more, months it's a little bit more easy and 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 the year I think is the same way right like there's patterns it's sort of cyclical 
Um, and we can start to anticipate and expect what we're going to need to do at any given time. Uh, right. Yeah. And how did you know that you wanted to um, pursue graduate studies specifically as well um, in the attentional neuroscience lab? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so I would say that the reason I knew that I wanted to get to go to graduate school um, was because I really developed a passion as an undergraduate. Um, first of all, I, I discovered a passion for psychology and I really, I really loved trying to understand how my mind was working at any given moment um, and why I was having experiences and, and just sort of everything that was going on. And that, that to me was really fascinating. And so I, I enjoyed that element of it. Um, I also really realized partway through that there, I'd, I'd had some wonderful professors and I'd had some not so wonderful professors. <laughs> and, you know, I realized, hey, I have this passion for it. And I think this is something that I could do. I think I could, I could teach if I wanted to. And so um, that to me was really the impetus. And I knew that the only way to, um, I knew that I wanted to teach psychology. And I knew that the only way I could do that was by acquiring a graduate degree. Um, so then your set, sort of the second part of that is how did I get to the attentional neuroscience lab? And I would, I would characterize it as, as a series of very fortunate occurrences that sort of ha happened. And my experience is probably unlike many other graduate students, but I was lucky enough as an undergraduate to get involved working in the lab um, as an undergrad RA. And then, um, I developed a passion specifically for the kind of work that we were doing. And I guess Dr. Handy looked at me and said, oh, I think you could probably do this. And so, um, you know, that, that kind of is how it all unfolded for me. And I, I'm very fortunate that that was the case. Right. And how would you describe the lab culture? And I guess the sorts of students that it generally tends to attract. Yeah, certainly. So, um, in our lab, I like to think that uh, specifically, I think we're talking for undergraduate RAs. Right. Right? Yeah. Okay. So for undergraduate RAs, there's a couple things that I look for. Um, I think first and foremost is responsibility. Um, I, you know, I think that it, I have, I can have a lot more faith in your ability um, and faith in the work that you do if I know that you're responsible and that you will do things the way that they need to be done and take pride in your own work. Um, and so I think that kind of all kind of rolls in together. So responsibility is like, for me, the number one cornerstone. Um, the other two, I think I, I'll stick to three just to keep the list short, because otherwise I could go on and on with all the things that I think make a great RA or make a great RA in our lab. But responsibility, um, I think maturity is also really critical. Um, I think that people who understand sort of what they want and why they're doing these things. Um, and it's okay if the, if the answer is, why do you want to do this? Well, I want to do this because I want to get experience so I can go somewhere else. Like, that's fine. That's, I, I prefer you to be transparent about it. Like, tell me up front and let's make this a really positive experience for you. But I think that maturity to say, okay, I'm coming in this is the work that I'm trying to get done. These are the things I want to learn. Um, and how can I ask Kyle or one of the other lab members to help me achieve those goals? That to me is really big. Um, and then what was the last one? I had three. I've forgotten it now, but uh, all right. <laughs> I'll come back to it. It'll pop into my brain. And I'll be like, oh yeah. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. Responsibility, maturity. And oh, I think just, you know, just generally a, a passion for learning, whatever mm -hmm. that looks like, whatever the context, I think that we're really fortunate in psychology that the application of what we do can be felt in many different fields, many different areas. So even if you are, you know, really not that interested in psychology specifically necessarily, or maybe not even that interested in the work that we're doing in the lab, there's so much overlap between things and there's so many different ways in which you can apply what we know 
into other fields and, and into other domains and disciplines, even within psychology. And so I think that there's um, just having a passion and enthusiasm is, is really, um, it makes coming into work and having meetings and, and chatting with you just that much more fun. It's just like, well, hey, I'm going to go have this enthusiastic conversation. I don't mind that it's going to be long because I know that it will be kind of fun. Right. And if a student doesn't have a lab, any lab experience, but is really interested in joining your lab, what is something that you potentially look for in the resume that would impress you? Oh, yeah. So <laughs> um, I like to think that our lab is maybe a bit different from others um, and that we don't necessarily explicitly ask for a resume, although there might be times where we would. Um, it, I think it's just sort of dependent. Um, but something that really stands out to me is, is just coming in and, and being curious, wanting to learn, um, because there's so many different ways that you can learn when you're working in a research environment. And it's not just necessarily about learning about the topic that you're researching, but it might be about learning how to analyze data or learning about sort of some of the, the thoughts and decisions that go into designing an experiment and when, when and why these questions are important to answer and how your answers dictate kind of the outcomes in the end. And so I think if you have that curiosity um, and you can, and we like to meet with anybody who joins the lab. So, you know, kind of an interview, it's usually very informal. Um, but having that curiosity and demonstrating that, yeah, I'm really interested. I want to learn this. Uh, these are the ways in which I think you can really help me achieve these goals. Then to me, that starts to become a really good fit. Mm -hmm. And speaking of data analysis, um, how did yeah. you personally start building your data analysis skills? And what is generally a good starting point for students who are interested in um, pursuing graduate studies where data analysis is critical? <laughs> yeah, so again, another really wonderful question. Um, let me start by with the caveat that I don't profess to be necessarily good at data analysis. Um, I would say <laughs> I would say that I maybe have more skills than the average person if you were to walk down the street. Maybe I would be the most qualified on any given block. <laughs> but at the same time, that doesn't mean that I'm necessarily that proficient. Um, but I think the way that I think there are kind of two ways that you can you can develop that proficiency. And one is understanding in the back end what is going on. And so it's one thing to be able to say, OK, I want SPSS or R or Jamovi or whatever program it is. I want SPSS to be able to run a linear regression. It's like, OK, great click, 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 and here's my output, right? But I think that sort of overlooks the fact that you're really glossing over what's happening in terms of this statistical mathematical side. And not to say that you need to fully understand all of the complexities of the analysis, um, the mathematical <laughs> you know, number crunching that has to go into it. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. But I think if you can kind of start to understand, oh, okay, I understand how linear regression is a special case of this or an, you know, an ANOVA is this, or, or like, if you can really start to get an understanding as to what that looks like, then you're in a good set or in a good space. And then the other part to that is honestly just getting in, finding some data, no matter what it is, and just playing around with it, um, learning how to, learning how to manipulate it in different ways. Um, every time I analyze data, I learn something new and it's most often simply by Googling an error that I got. <laughs> okay, I don't know what this problem is. Let's see what Google has to say. And, and surely somebody else has had that problem. And so at that point, they're able to come in and say, hey, uh, this is the problem. This is why you're having the problem. And this is the resolution. And so if you can start to kind of build that repertoire of recognizing, okay, I know how this program works. I know what my problems are. I know what the pitfalls are. Then, and you can kind of start to work with data in, in whatever respect, then you're, you're golden. I know, right. I know, for example, like uh, R has a number of what they call base data sets. And so they're just data sets are included. You can load them up 
uh, one of the more commonly one uh, commonly used ones. Um, I think it's called MT cars. I don't know what the MT stands for, but it's cars. And it's just about like different cars and their statistics, like different values attributed to them. And so if you go in and just start playing with that and you can start to understand, okay, I can rename columns and I can shift things around and I can run a, a simple little regression, then suddenly you're, you know, you're, you're way ahead of the rest of the field. Right. And pivoting more towards um, the research aspect of being a grad student, how do you decide on a certain thing or question that you really want to pursue? Is it that you read a whole bunch of literature and find a knowledge gap or is it, do you have a more structured approach to that? Oh, <laughs> more structured? I would say that's the more <laughs> structured. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, let me think on that. I, I would say that the, I would say that the way that you would want to approach it, if I were doing it over again, the way that I'd want to approach it is I'd want to really have some ideas to something I'm passionate about mm -hmm. and something I'm really curious about. I want to understand at a deeper level or at a different level. Um, and so I don't necessarily think you have to come in understanding what the knowledge gaps are um, and therefore what good research questions are. I don't necessarily think that's the case. But I do think that you should come in and, and be able to say, I'm really passionate about this. And I'm really curious about maybe why this occurs. And if you can kind of start with that, like a, a very simple, I like this, I'm curious about this, or there's some problem here and I'd like to understand it more in depth. Then as you go, you'll discover that there are other people who are doing similar work and they're, they're probably really smart and you'll feel intimidated by it. And that's okay. That's good. That means that you're asking good questions. And so part of the process of grad school is recognizing is, is learning what's already been done and then learning how to ask questions and answer them in ways that haven't been done. Right. And so you don't need to come in. I, I don't think personally, I don't think you need to come in already understanding the first half of that. I think that's outrageous. That's not the point of an undergraduate degree. Um, you know, and, and often if you find a specific topic area, there's just way too much literature on it. You'd never be able to understand it all uh, or you'll not understand it, but you'll never be able to learn it all in that time period. So that's part of what the graduate school experience is about is learning sort of the depth of everything else that's already ongoing. Right. And what would you say are the challenges of being a researcher? Like, do you have certain patterns or certain recurring problems that really frustrates you about being a researcher? Uh, yeah. So <laughs> where do we start? Uh, how much time <laughs> do you have? No, I, <laughs> I, I say that sort of jokingly, but there are definitely a number of uh, sort of things that I think are important to think about um, when it comes to research and maybe when it comes to grad school more broadly. Um, and I've already kind of touched on a couple of them, but one of them I think is really important is maturity. Um, I like to make, I like to make silly jokes. I'm, I don't pretend to be, you know, a super formal person. Um, but at the same time, I think that you have to recognize that, that when you get into grad school, the expectations are a little bit different. Um, and so you're not going, you know, you don't necessarily get midterms to know how well you're doing. Right. And so, I remember going through, especially in the first couple of years of my PhD, but even to some extent in my master's, where I would go through literally months where I'd be working and I wouldn't really have any, any indication to know necessarily that I was doing what I needed to be doing at that moment in time. And so you have to be able to maintain sort of that the way the maturity comes in is that you have to know, okay these are things that I need to accomplish and I need to be sort of at least somewhat disciplined in my approach. So I think that's kind of one aspect of it. In terms of the research side, I have a lot of bad habits. I think when it comes to research, <laughs> I'll be up front. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that I always, I always get super excited about projects and I, I, I like get going 
and you you know firsthand I get super super excited about something and then suddenly I'm like wait oh man there's just like a million problems Uh, we've got to solve to get even remotely close to what we wanted to do we need to solve at least half of these problems and so you kind of have to back off certain projects sometimes because you realize there's just simply too much overhead or this project is simply is going to take on a life of its own that I that is beyond the scope of what I'm capable of doing right now in terms of my time or resources or whatever it is um and so that's kind of that to me is the one thing that I continuously continuously do is sort of bite off more than I can chew right uh, I don't know keeps me engaged and makes me think about things differently so I mean it all stems from a place of passion Sure. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's a kind way of putting it. Yeah. And speaking of passion, what motivated you spe- to get into this specific area of study um, attention as opposed to say clinical psychology? Sure. Yeah. So um, for me to get into, I, well, I, I'll say this. I think that I'm a bit of a Uh, of a black sheep in some respects in this lab, in the lab that I'm in, because my work isn't exclusively on attention. And so my research covers a number of different psychological processes and functions. And so as a consequence, I don't necessarily think of myself as an attentional neuroscientist, even though that's what the sign says on the door. Um, (laughs) I do think of myself as sort of a cognitive researcher. I, I study cognition and, and cognitive processes, but I also take a very uh, health-oriented twist to it. And so for those unfamiliar, my work focuses on how uh, health factors and specifically physical activity, how those impact um, your cognitive function at any given moment in time. And so um, in many respects, I think of myself almost as a health researcher a health psychologist who, who is a cognitive scientist or a cognitive scientist who is a health psychologist, if that makes sense. And all of that goes back to what we had talked about off the start, which is that I like to think of ways in which I like to think that my work might have meaningful impact for people. And so if I can encourage them to act in certain ways, knowing that it will impact them, not just physiologically. So hey, if you exercise more, you tend to be fitter and you don't die of heart disease, that kind of thing. Like, yeah, okay, we all know that. But what if I can explain or what if I can demonstrate to you ways in which, hey, you'll you'll be more attentive and, and you'll be uh, better able to remember things and that'll help you on your next midterm. That to me is a very tangible benefit for students and, and for the, you know, the general community more broadly. And so if I can start to leverage what I know and put it into practice in ways that are meaningful for people, then maybe I can, I can impact change in the world. Right. And this is actually a perfect segue into my next question, which is um, what are some exciting new projects or research that your lab is currently um, investigating? Yeah. So uh, we have one project that I kind of alluded to before, and I'm not the one to speak on it because it's, I wasn't involved with it, but I, I can't say enough about that line of research. I think um, I think that uh, Sumit, my colleague who has been working on it, has is just doing incredible stuff. And I wish desperately that I was in some way involved because I think it's such a cool topic. Um, as for me, some of the cool stuff, cool stuff, I, at least stuff I'm passionate about, stuff I'm really interested in, um, stuff that you're familiar with. Uh, we are rec- we've recently been working on understanding how, um, how health behaviors impact not just objective measures of cognitive function. So not just, you know, you come into the lab and you press a button when you see an arrow, like not that kind of thing, but we want to understand more deeply how um, your health factors and health behaviors impact the way you feel about the way your brain is working. And so we're taking kind of this, we call it, uh, metacognitive perspective on things. So we're taking, we're almost taking a step up and back and looking down upon it and saying, oh, okay, well, I, I know that I was able to pay pretty good attention when you were asking me questions. So I think I'm doing okay metacognitively. 
right? Like, and so, so that kind of thing is, is something that I'm really interested in because I think it provides a really interesting avenue into understanding the way that cognition works, um, especially in healthy populations. Right, right. Um, actually, I was editing the Merck poster earlier this morning. So <laughs> Excellent. Okay. A very timely discussion. Um, sure. And for fellow um, UBC psych alumni listeners, um, is your lab interested in hiring people uh, who have graduated UBC already? Oh, um, I've never thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? I mean, here's the thing. If you are, uh, if, if you satisfy those three criteria I set out previously, so you're passionate, you're mature, uh, and you are, damn it, I forgot the third one again. I don't know what it was, but go back, re-listen to what I said earlier and just insert that right now onto what I'm saying. But if you, if you are those, you know, if you satisfy those three things, um, then yeah, I think you're going to be a good fit. And I don't think I would necessarily turn you away simply because you graduated. Um, especially not if you, especially not if you're interested in, in kind of getting a better understanding as to what graduate school is like. Um, and maybe you're considering applying at some point, whether to our lab or to a different lab, then I think that's a really good opportunity for you to get involved. Um, yeah. Right. And who is the best person to get in touch with if they are interested in applying to to your lab and perhaps you could kindly speak on whether there's a standard procedure or certain hiring periods to be aware of? Yeah, no, that's, uh, those are really good questions. So typically what we'd say, what I'd suggest, uh, what, whether it's our lab or any other lab for that matter, usually at least either the lab manager or the director. So in this case, it would be Dr. Handy. Um, Dr. Handy will occasionally get emails from students saying, you know, I'd like to join your lab. Do you have any positions available? And Dr. Handy will actually forward those to the rest of us. And so we'll be able to see them. Then we respond back saying, yeah, I'm, I'm looking for somebody. Maybe we can meet or, or, you know, we can set up a time to chat with them or whatever. Um, so that's typically the best way to go about it. Um, if you are particularly passionate uh, about one specific area, like I've, I've outlined that our lab kind of does a few different things. So if you're really passionate about something that one person in our lab does, contact them directly. Um, you can find all of our emails on our lab website. You can just go to us, send us an email saying, hey, I'm really curious about this. I'd love to maybe work with you or get to know kind of more about your research. Um, so that's sort of the way that I approach it. In terms of what to actually include or say in the email, um, yeah, just that you're interested, that you're really, you know, enthusiastic about this kind of work and maybe highlight, you know, why, you know, I'm curious because, and that because part can really be informative. And then as for the last part of that question, you know, time period, um, I would say that the most critical times are right before the beginning of the semester, because uh, right before the beginning of the fall semester specifically. So late August, early September, that's when most of the projects that we're trying to get started are kind of getting underway. And that's when we'll need the most, typically the most assistance at least, or we, we anticipate having work for you to do. And so, um, yeah, kind of any time in August or early September is when I kind of target apply. Right, right. And lastly, as a closing question, it sounds like there's a lot to deal with as a graduate student. And do you have maybe any hobbies or outside uh, things that you do outside of academia that maybe helps you manage your stress from a day-to-day -day <laughs> basis? So yeah, that, um, right now I'm in the middle of writing my comprehensive exam, which is a very large, it's really just a paper. I don't know why we always make it out to be a lot more stressful than it is, but it is stressful. Um, and so I've been trying to find anything to keep my mind preoccupied when I'm not sitting in front of my computer writing. Um, and so I found um, a couple different things that I really enjoy doing. One of them is I, I really enjoy cooking. Um, and I find that that's a nice way to sort of take a half hour or however long it needs to be to sort of disengage and be focused entirely on something else. Um, so that's a good one. 
Uh, I've gotten into walking a lot recently. So, you know, just getting out. Uh, I live in a really great neighborhood where I'm able to uh, walk along the water. And so kind of just getting out and, and speaking of the paper that I mentioned earlier about the restorative effects of nature, like that uh, maybe, maybe intuitively in the, or subconsciously, <laughs> I'm like kind of realizing that. And then obviously coupled with my work on physical activity and why that's important, maybe, maybe it's all kind of coming together and I'm, I'm, you know, taking walking as that kind of <laughs> expression of that knowledge. But um, yeah, those are kind of a couple hobbies that I like to just sort of yeah. keep my mind occupied and, and uh, yeah, get out fresh I air. <laughs> right. I do hear that you have a podcast going on. Um, could you lightly touch on on yeah. that a bit? Sure. Yeah. So uh, um, I am the co-host of Brain Buzz podcast and uh, it's a science podcast dedicated to making science engaging and open uh, and accessible for people of all knowledge bases. And so we really uh, we really emphasize getting world-class researchers onto the program to talk about some of the exciting stuff going on in their world and honestly for me it's a really enlightening experience because as a I get I I'm so in, in tune and, and narrowly focused on my own little research area that I don't I I sometimes forget that there's all this wonderful stuff going out on outside of just my realm so it's a really enlightening experience um, and I feel like I learned something every time I, I host the show. So, right. Well, thank you very much for sharing your insights and for lending your time. Uh, we hope that this has been a useful podcast for those intending to join the Intentional Neuroscience Lab and fellow psych students who are considering pursuing MA or PhD. So, once again, thank you very much, Kyle, for joining us and have a great day.